Hi, my name is Allison Mounts, and it's my pleasure and privilege to be chairing this event tonight. Uh, we're here to celebrate the book launch and discuss uh, the important book that's been published just this year, a national project, Syrian Refugee Resettlement in Canada. Before we begin our conversation, I want to start by acknowledging that we are, although we're gathered virtually here today through Zoom, which is a new experience for many of us, relatively speaking, um, the institution that brings us together, the Balsili School for International Affairs, is actually built on the traditional territories of the neutral Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. And it's always important, particularly when we're talking about contemporary issues of displacement and human migration, that we remember past experiences and long histories of migration and displacement um, that, that we connect to uh, across time and space. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, I am the director of the International Migration Research Center, which is housed at Wilfrid Laurier University. And this event is sponsored by two groups, by both the, a, a research cluster, which exists within the Balsili School, which is called the Cluster for Study of Migration, Mobility, and Social Policy and by the International Migration Research Center, or the IMRC. So thanks to those two groups for organizing us here um, today. It's very exciting to get an opportunity to discuss this book, which is such uh, an important resource for so many reasons, um, primarily because of the, the scope of the displacement of Syrians in recent years and the scale of their arrival here in Canada. Um, Syrians are playing and will continue to play such an important role in Canadian society. Um, and this book looks at different phases of their arrival and resettlement and experiences here in Canada, as well as at the responsiveness and engagement of both the Canadian government and Canadian civil society. So there's so much to discuss. There are so many contributors to this volume, which is an edited volume. And we're lucky to have here today um, the three editors of the volume, whom I'll introduce to you, as well as three esteemed panelists, colleagues who will discuss um, the, the contents and importance of the book. So shortly, um, we will hear from everyone and I'll introduce everyone. Before I pass the baton over to my colleagues to tell us about the book, I just want to tell everyone the plan for the evening um, and then we'll end a little bit of technical information and then we'll start the presentation. So what's going to happen is for about 10 or 15 minutes, our three editors, who I believe are now showing on everyone's screen, uh, will we'll talk about the book and then we will have about 10 minutes each um, hearing responses from um, doctors Chris Anderson and Audrey Macklin and Brie Ackeson, who I'll introduce more fully uh, momentarily. For those who are here attending, who aren't speaking, we hope you will join us in conversation through Zoom by using the Q&A function. So not chat, but Q&A, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Throughout the presentations and conversation, you can enter comments and questions there. And we'll all be monitoring those and we'll bring those to the panelists when everyone is done speaking we have a chance to open up and all discuss things so we encourage you to add your questions and comments there so with that let me introduce you to our editors uh, dr leah hamilton is professor in the Bizet school of business at mount royal university Dr. Luina, Luisa Veronis is an associate professor in geography, environment, and geomatics, and research chair in immigration and Franco-Ontarian communities at the University of Ottawa. And Dr. Margaret Walton Roberts is professor of geography and environmental studies at Wilfrid Laurier University, and also like me, based at the Balsili School of International Affairs. So thank you all for this wonderful collection and please take it away. Great. So maybe I'll start. Um, are we sharing the screen? Or oh, okay, excellent. Thank you so much. So um, 
I'm really, thank you so much, Alison, and thank you to the panelists and to the audience for joining us uh, for this event. Um, when we, we worked on this book, and there's a, there's a backstory in terms of how we, we worked on this book, but it's, I would say we began thinking about the national project and we were very interested in John McCallum's comment. He was the Minister of Immigration at the time when he said, this is not a federal government project. This is even not even a government project. This is a national project that will involve all Canadians. And he said that in 20, 2015. And, and it really was a kind of a, a massive event that many people were involved in. Um, and we were interested in the fact that so many people had participated in settling refugees, so many sponsors, so many communities stepped up. And so the edited collection is really a reflection of that. And we hoped that it would mark this particular event and it would be something that people could look back on and understand what happened. Um, so the National Project records an event that transformed Canada in many ways. The book includes diverse voices, refugee sponsors, receiving communities, government officials, and as well as Syrian refugees. And all of these people participated in many of the projects featured in the book. We're pleased to discuss the book today with a panel of researchers and we're enormously grateful to them for participating. But we're also delighted to announce that in order to reflect the full range of issues associated with this book and that are reflected in the event of Canada's um, resettlement of Syrian refugees, we're also going to be planning another event later this fall that will focus on Syrian Canadian, Canadian community experiences and successes since the 2015-17 period. And so with that, I would like to hand it over to my colleagues. Thanks, Margaret. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the edited collection, um, which I hope you're enjoying for those of you that have started reading it. Um, when Louisa and Margaret and I were really excitedly discussing this book launch, we decided not to spend much time discussing the events that led up to Canada's Syrian Refugee Resettlement Initiative, knowing that you are an informed audience. But that said, we wanted to give you a bit of context about this edited collection. So as you know, the federal government launched an initiative known as Operation Syrian Refugees in November 2015. So ultimately, Canada resettled 26,172 Syrian refugees in 118 days. And by January of 2017, a total of about 40,000 Syrian refugees had been resettled. So during this time in 2016, one of Canada's federal research funding agencies, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, or SHRC, partnered with Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada to award 27 rapid response grants. So these were targeted grants for academics that were examining different dimensions of Syrian refugee resettlement. This really was an unprecedented funding call and ultimately 12 of those funded projects are featured in this multidisciplinary edited collection. So as I'll discuss in detail on the next slide, the book features multiple voices and perspectives with a large focus on amplifying the voices of Syrian refugees, including women and families. Chapters also include research conducted with settlement uh, workers and other key actors in resettlement. Many of the projects in the book do feature qualitative methodologies, but there are also quantitative projects and case studies. I also want to point out that this is an interdisciplinary collection, so it features chapters from diverse academic disciplines, including health, geography, political science, psychology, social work, and others. And our intention for the book was that by triangulating across these multiple perspectives and disciplines, we would help to create a more fulsome understanding of the contrasting perspectives and actors that were involved in this resettlement effort. I want to tell you a little bit about the structure of this edited collection. So the book is organized into two main parts. Uh, part one focuses on the perspectives of Syrian refugees, while part two focuses on the Syrian refugee resettlement context more broadly. So each part is divided into two subsections, which help to shed light on contrasting perspectives, actors, and regions. So part 1A covers um, Syrian refugees' experiences with resettlement, reception, and integration, including experiences with accessing resettlement information and health needs. 
and part 1b takes sort of a deeper dive into the experiences of Syrian refugee children, youth, and families. So as many of you know, these demographic groups were really highly represented among this cohort of refugees and their resettlement success is vital. Part two of the book complements the focus on refugee perspectives by examining the role of the Syrian refugee resettlement context more broadly. So here the lens in the book shifts to wider infrastructures and supports. Part 2A covers the perspectives of civil society and communities. Um, it focuses on settlement agencies, private sponsors and sponsorship agreement holders, community groups and volunteers. And many of the chapters in part 2A focus on Canada's main gateway cities and other large urban areas. Part 2B complements this by documenting the experiences of rural areas and smaller urban centers in Canada. I don't have time to get into a lot of details here, but we did want to highlight that um, even though the chapters in the book offer very different disciplinary and regional perspectives and center different actors, when we were editing the collection, Margaret and Louisa and I found that there were six intersecting themes that emerged across the different chapters. So first, the chapters in the book discuss the resettlement challenges that were common for Syrian refugees, including physical and emotional losses. Second, the book focuses a lot on how Syrian refugees were represented in academic work, in the media, and in political and public discourse. Next, the chapters highlight the critical need to address structural barriers to integration by better understanding the resettlement ecosystem within the larger social policy landscape in Canada. Chapters in the collection also describe the importance of collaboration and innovation among a range of stakeholders and across multiple sectors. And this showcases how partnership building truly is an essential framework for refugee resettlement, which we're seeing again as the resettlement uh, sector responds during the current pandemic. The book also highlights how Canada's Syrian refugee resettlement initiative was a national project, as Margaret said, and how the long term retention and settlement of refugees in communities will depend upon the social and economic integration they ultimately experience in those communities. Finally, as with any significant resettlement effort, the local context of reception is important. It's capacity, it's preparedness, engagement and resilience. These factors in the local context are essential both for immediate resettlement, but also for long term successful integration. Now I'm going to turn things over to Louisa, who's going to be speaking about the key lessons learned from Canada's experience with Syrian refugee resettlement. Hey, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to my colleagues and to the panelists and Alison and the Bilzilla School for hosting us. It, this is an exciting moment. So rather than speaking about detailed contents, we still wanted everyone to go away with uh, some highlights and high level lessons that we've learned uh, through this experience of putting the book together. So on the next slide, um, I'm going to speak to both what worked, uh, the things that went well, and also areas of improvement. So first, in terms of what worked across uh, the different chapters, there are three main lessons that we would like to highlight. First, the fact that IRCC also funds a number of indirect resettlement programs, and in addition to uh, direct Settlement supports and programs like orientation, uh, language training, employment, or different uh, subsidies in childcare and transportation. There are a number of indirect programs that probably people don't necessarily know much about, but played a key role in facilitating and supporting um, the relationships that the new coming um, refugees developed with Canadian. Canadians and communities. One of those programs is the Community Connections Program that many immigrant agencies are providing. These are generally community activities and events. It can range from things like conversation classes in English and French, sports or cultural activities, youth engagement programs, and the community connections played a key role in a number of ways. First, for a lot of the uh, newly arrived Syrians, it allowed them to develop uh, social networks and also engage with Canadians, learn about Canadian activities 
activities like hockey, for example, and it uh, supported their uh, feelings of uh, belonging and sense of belonging they developed by connecting with Canadians and the country. On the other hand, a lot of Canadians also partook in a lot of these activities and the Community Connections program really allowed engagement between the newly arrived Syrians and uh, the community more broadly. Another key program are the settlement workers in schools, uh, commonly known as SWISS. Um, their role became crucial as well in supporting children and youth once they arrived in the new schools, providing them a variety of supports, linguistic, cultural, and also um, watching for warning signs about mental health or academic performance issues. The Swiss program is also key insofar as it doesn't support only children and youth, but also the broader families. And given that schools play a key role in the community in Canada, some newcomers that maybe were not connected to service providers were connected to services and programs and support through uh, the settlement workers who work in schools. A second key lesson is the importance of having a performance uh, measurements and outcomes plan in place right from the very get-go, from the very beginning. And this is something the Canadian government uh, did and was very forward-thinking especially because IRCC had already been collecting a variety of data in collaboration with other federal government departments and stakeholders, including service providers. And they had been doing this for some years, so they had developed a certain level of expertise and also fine-tuned some of the data, which means that right from the beginning, they were able to put in place a sound measurement plan and within a very relatively short time frame, were able to collect data that became important, particularly to measure the outcomes and be able to see the benefits of uh, the Syrian Refugee Resettlement Initiative. And thirdly, as uh, Leah mentioned briefly in turn, um, I'm sorry, it was actually, uh, Margaret, I think both of you, you did mention this. Um, what was particularly timely was uh, the rapid collaboration between IRCC and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada in partnering together to set up a targeted funding program that uh, moved very, very quickly and allowed opportunity for researchers to uh, collaborate and mobilize expertise very rapidly. So leading migration scholars, some of who are in the book, some of who are among our panelists and probably also in the audience, partnered often um, creating collaborative uh, projects with experienced practitioners as well as other key stakeholders in the communities and this allowed um, to develop very rapid uh, evidence and knowledge about this experience many of those projects are now in in this collection but also elsewhere elsewhere and fed into the policy making uh, process and also the public perception of refugee resettlement by providing timely and informed data on the experience in terms of what can be improved um, again, things worked pretty well, and I think we should celebrate, especially in light of sort of the fifth anniversary of when all of this started. But there are a number of uh, areas that we would like to highlight as needing a bit of improvement. So drawing from the rich findings of the 13 projects that are outlined in this volume, and I think our collective uh, experience and expertise in the area are, are, are things that we can think in terms of trying to improve. The first um, comment relates to the very accelerated timeline that was not ideal. You may recall the frantic experience of fall 2015, where uh, the Liberal government ran on a platform of uh, sponsoring refugees from Syria to come to Canada. 
and things moved very, very quickly, and they announced somewhat of an unrealistic timeline of uh, bringing to Canada 25,000 Syrian refugees within a couple of months or three months. This was eventually achieved within 102 days, which is remarkable in itself, but created a lot of extra stress that maybe could have been prevented. So having a more realistic timeline would have contributed to many stakeholders, which is point number two here, the need to move so quickly and evacuate people, in this case, refugees who were in a relatively stable environment, most most of them were in UN refugee camps where they had shelter and food. And within a very short time frame, having them leave this area in order to come to Canada uh, was not an ideal situation, not only for the families, the refugees themselves, who were not able to prepare adequately, but also in Canada for stakeholders, for settlement um, service providers who didn't have uh, the right timeline, who didn't have the right information about who was coming and when, for sponsors who were waiting in limbo uh, for extra weeks uh, while they had already rented apartments and so on. So the timeline um, could have been a bit more uh, realistic in order to lead to uh, a more concrete and better experience. Nevertheless, we pulled this off. And the third comment relates um, to some consequences when uh, policymakers rush into creating specific programs that unfortunately may have um, create inequities between groups. In this particular case, the Syrian refugees uh, received extra attention support. Uh, there was awareness and mobilizing, but the programs created um, inequities between different cohorts of refugees, whereas other refugees didn't necessarily receive the same treatment and put settlement service providers in a very difficult position of having um, to uh, deal differently with different groups. So settlement providers, and I think a lot of the communities involved really quite tried their best to overcome these inequities, but it was a difficult situation. There was also issues of creating inequities between uh, newly arrived uh, families and vulnerable groups in Canada, and this really came to the fore uh, during uh, this intense period of arrival in things like access to housing, for example, which was really at the forefront of the issues. So moving forward, policymakers and I guess communities should be more mindful of ethical and moral implications that arise when a particular cohort of refugees, but it can be in other areas, are perceived or actually do get preferential treatment. In conclusion, we hope that by documenting this uh, national project, Canada's experience with Operation Syrian Refugees, we hope that this volume, this edited collection, uh, will bring uh, critical reflections of uh, the experience of refugee resettlement. And uh, by showcasing the perspectives of various actors, the innovative practices that came out, by amplifying the voices of the Syrian refugees themselves and all the other groups, we really hope to inform national and international approaches to refugee uh, resettlement and provide a, a more complex uh, systems view of the interrelationships um, in the complex interrelations between structures, actors, and processes in uh, refugee resettlement and eventually uh, lead the path to more humanizing approach to resettlement. So we are excited to hear about what the panelists think and also uh, the audience, but we really hope that ultimately this volume will um, be seen as a document, as an archive of this uh, amazing project that Canada put in place and hopefully will offer many important lessons that can be uh, put in practice in the future. So to uh, wrap up our presentation, I would like to acknowledge 
on the next slide uh, the funders who supported uh, the publication of this book, including Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, the award we received for scholarly publishing program, the Belzili School and Pathways to Prosperity, who all supported us and facilitated the process. On the next slide, um, we have a lot of people to thank. First, we want to thank the Belzili School and Joanne Weston for uh, making this virtual book lounge possible. Our uh, chair to the event, uh, Alison and our panelists, we, who we hope will have good things to say, but bring us also constructive comments. And the amazing editorial team at McGill Queens University Press, especially our editor, Jacqueline Mason and Kathleen Fraser, we received excellent comments that helped us improve from two anonymous reviewers. We worked with a great team of copy editors, Zabine, Diana and Edwin, were very, very careful in every detail. We had um, the ongoing support from IRCC, including Umit, Lorna, and David in the entire process. And finally, we would like to thank everyone for um, us being able to put together this national project that reflects hopefully the effort at the national level from all and everyone involved. Okay, thank you so much, Louisa, Leah, and Margaret. I know it's not easy to summarize an enormous body of work in a short period of time, so well done. I'm impressed, thank you for that. Um, we now, I should say, if any of you out there are just joining us, um, you, you are listening to the launch of a national project, Syrian Refugee Resettlement in Canada. We've just heard from the three editors of the collection, and now we are going to turn to three panelists who've kindly joined us to discuss the book. Um, and I'd like to introduce the first panelist who is uh, my colleague at Wilfrid Laurier University, Dr. Chris Anderson. Chris is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Wilfrid Laurier. Chris, thank you for being here and starting off our panel of discussants. Thank you very much, Allison, and thank you to the organizers, especially thank you to Leah, Luisa, uh, Margaret, uh, for the invitation to share in what is just a celebration of a wonderful work. Um, it did, I'm going to talk a, a bit about what it does, obviously, but it certainly, a couple of things it does, it clarifies, it consolidates, it contributes, and it challenges. Um, there's a lot in this, and as hard as it is to summarize, it's really hard to react to it in 10 minutes, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so I'm coming to it not as someone directly involved in refugee resettlement. I'm coming as more of a sort of political historian of Canadian refugee policy. So my comments are kind of extending with that and from that sort of perspective. And three things I want to talk about. One is I want to talk about what I like about this collection. Two, I want to su uh, suggest some directions I think extend really well from this uh, collection. And finally, I want to uh, commit a small grammatical error, um, possibly a small grammatical offense to try to reflect an idea that I uh, have about this collection. So first, what I really like. Um, to do that, what I did in my sort of historical band was I went and went back to some of the old texts from the 1980s, right? We have uh, Southeast Asian exodus here. We have the Indo-Chinese refugee movement here. Um, going back to kind of see how far have we come and how does this work reflect how far we've come? Um, and it becomes strikingly obvious just how much richer our understanding uh, of, the, uh, of the sort of resettlement, of the practice of resettlement in Canada is today. And this, this volume very much reflects that that richness is fully on display. And by richer, there's a couple of things I mean um, that you really sort of get in this volume. One is that literature, it's broader, it's deeper, it's multifaceted, it's interdependent. The nature of resettlement, we understand in so much more nuanced and subtle ways and really important ways, um, after all, because it's about the sort of the, the, the ability uh, to sort of achieve that sort of that, 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 that resettlement process in a sort of a meaningful way in a fulfilling way. And the analysis has moved from being anecdotal to much more systematic and rigorous, um, really trying to sort of be much, um, to, to, to sort of have a richer conversation between ourselves and among ourselves about what we mean and how far we think we can take knowledge. It's interdisciplinary because of that, and you see that in this volume. Um, before, you had a lot of individuals in these older texts who sort of seemed alone in their discipline, trying to talk about refugee issues. Now, each discipline has a sort of rich population of people, and we're talking across those boundaries. And in fact, not just disciplinary boundaries academically, but but uh, into the practitioner realm and having those conversations as well. And this is just wonderfully reflected in this volume. It's creative, there's these productive linkages. And finally, by richer, I mean inclusive. 
um, this very conscious recognition of the need to, even as there are difficulties in ensuring that lived experience of refugees, those who work with refugees, are really well anchored within the analysis, um, and the analysis reflects that. So for these reasons alone, a national project just offers, it offers a, a really wonderful benchmark, a foundation um, for understanding the refugee resettlement in Canada, and it offers, however, I'm going to get to my next point, much more. And this is where I want to get to my second idea of the directions that I think extend well from this collection. And, and here I, I, I'm going to pull out, I could have pulled out many quotes because I think this idea comes up a number of times, um, but Damare Rose and Alexandra Charette, they have a chapter where they talk about housing, um, a really important issue that was front and center, certainly in the media and certainly in the, on the ground um, in terms of refugee resettlement. They say this research also highlights the need for housing policy changes that would benefit not only high needs newcomers, but also other low-income Canadians. And it struck me, and it did several times in this book, as much as it's a book about Syrian refugee resettlement, it's more than that. Um, it's challenging us to make other sorts of connections beyond this particular movement. And certainly, um, extending from Rose and Charette, um, it's challenging us to think about connections that can be drawn between policies and practices of refugee resettlement and the needs of others. Um, larger exercises in, in thinking about social welfare transformation in terms of support and accessibility. And, and a theme that comes through this text, and, and I think we've seen it broad, more broadly in the literature, there, there are so many possibilities that have been opened up because we've had the Syrian refugee movement and the connections between those who work more broadly in social welfare and refugee advocates and refugee practitioners and refugees themselves are much richer than they ever have been. So the potential to try to sort of push for other forms of change to reframe refugee policy in the larger discourse of social welfare, I think is, 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 is it's just there, it's, it's, it's ready for us. Um, but other ways, it's, it's pushing us to, to, to think about the connections. What lessons um, can we draw that are really about the Syrian refugee movement? How many of them, and then what ways are they portable to other refugee movements coming to Canada, whether it's individuals coming from different countries or smaller movements are coming? I think that'll be an important thing for us to think about is what is really extraordinary about this, um, and what is actually something that carries across different movements, and how can we make some of these findings be portable across them? Um, something that struck me was the idea of looking a bit further beyond the Canadian case. We tend to think of the national project, the Canadian expertise, the Canadian ability. I think sometimes it leads us not to look to other countries um, that are doing really interesting things that maybe we tend to focus so much on what we're doing, we forget to look at them to see how could we learn from them. The United States, for example, does a lot more in terms of pre-departure preparation for refugees. Um, and that's really something interesting we could begin to think more about. Why don't we, you're meant, I think it's mentioned in the book, why don't we do this? And so maybe those are connections we can begin to make. The last connection I want to do before I get to my grammatical error, and ooh, I'm in good time. I'm Speaking so fast, I'll be done in like 10 seconds here. I'll slow it down. But the last one I want to think about is connections that struck me was moving. How do we move from what often are these really kind of almost ad hoc responses, these sort of emergent confirmed best practices as we keep moving, we're always moving forward, right? And this is why this book is great because it allows us to step back and take stock. But now that we're stepping back and take stock, how do we move from this sort of collective wisdom, this knowledge to begin to, to kind of promote institutional policy change? Where do, in a way, do we bring the state back into this and sort of think about how the state can change? There's a quote at the beginning, I can't remember which chapter, it says the IRCC conceptualizes integration as a two-way process. That's pretty classic. But here in which government offers programs and then the refugees and newcomers commit to adapt. And that's a pretty narrow, singular sort of idea about resettlement means. Elsewhere in the book, your authors are talking about things like reciprocity and recognition. So how can we bring some of these lessons and maybe get a different ethos of that relationship between the state and its role um, and, and sort of push that further? And it sounds like the Syria case has done that to degrees. How can we build off that um, to really sort of rethink about the role of the state and sort of helping to push some of this forward? And that brings me to my my small grammatical error, I guess it depends on your outlook on grammar, whether it's small or not, um, to try to reflect an idea. And this, in a way, comes back to the title, the National Project. In the word project, I pulled up one definition as a noun, means an individual or collaborative enterprise that is carefully planned and designed to achieve a particular aim. And I think the Syrian uh, Refugee Resettlement Initiative very much was that, right? There, there was a project that had some boundaries, really important ones. But I think as your book makes clear, it is so much more than just that. Okay? Um, history certainly shows that, that refugee resettlement is not a project with a finite end and sort of narrow set of aims, but it's one that constitutes a perpetual ongoing work in progress. Um, it's, a, it's a construction site uh, quite often that we continue to build. We're not even sure what we're building entirely, but we know we're in this process of building in a really important process. So to capture that, I wanted to now maybe permit my modest grammatical error. 
Um, there are approaches called uh, nominalization when you turn a verb into a noun. Um, when your students say, I got a big ask of you, professor, um, they're doing that. They're sort of committing the slight error. We get what they mean. And I want to think about project in terms of a verb. It means to extend outward beyond something else to protrude. So the lessons we learn, and certainly the National Project offers them in multitudes, um, these, these lessons are tools, right? And these tools can be used to create new possibilities, um, maybe to continue to do things we do very well, but maybe create new possibilities to do it better for refugees or for Canada as a national project. That's extending outward beyond. And ideally, and maybe this is the political scientist sort of hat in me coming on, um, to protrude, maybe we can use these lessons to protrude politically. Um, to maybe affect a bit more political change because we now have a stronger foundation in knowledge, these lessons we've learned that we can build upon as a foundation to maybe push in some new directions. So those are my comments. Thank you very much and what a wonderful book and thanks again for letting me participate today. Thank you so much, Chris, for starting us off. Uh, for those of, uh, of you who are just joining us out there, uh, we're hearing from panelists who are responding to the wonderful edited collection, A National Project, which has just come out. Um, and I remind you, everyone, that if you have any questions or comments, we invite you to use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask them or state them. And we will have a chance shortly to discuss everything and I want to say thank you to Glenis Yancey and Phuket Bhutan for asking our first questions. Um, okay, our next contributor is another colleague of ours at Wilfrid Laurier University. This is Dr. Bree Oxen, who is an associate professor in the Faculty of Social Work at Laurier. Thank you for joining us, Bree. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really looking forward to the questions and the discussion, actually, but everything that everyone said so far has been really um, thought provoking and making me think about some of the things that I've observed and read. Um, my background is a bit different as well. I, I'm, I'm, I do research with uh, Syrian refugee families in Lebanon. Um, and so I haven't done as much work with uh, refugee families who have actually uh, made it to Canada. Um, but I, I do have a different hat that I wear that I am actually a private sponsor. So I was a part of a group that um, sponsored a, a refugee family who came over. Um, the family was actually um, a government sponsored family first came over and then they wanted to be reunified with the rest of their family. And so our private group sponsored the um, this, the, the, the extended family. Um, and it was such a fulfilling process, such an amazing experience. I learned so much. I learned also, you know, from I know probably more from um, the families, the, the two families that we were working with. Um, so this book really touched me on two different levels from an academic perspective, but also from a personal perspective. Um, I think we all, we, we kind of, the news from Syria ebbs and flows a lot. So we see, you know, when something terrible happens, um, you know, it's maybe one of the one of the headlines, but um, you know, the war continues to rage today, um, nine years after it started. And um, I think I was just reading today, there's, you know, brutal government sponsored bombings in one of the, the oldest um, kind of strongholds for rebel groups there in Syria. So families are still facing a lot of um, a lot of stress, not unable to go back home. Um, there's so many different elements that, that are at play that I think uh, that this book did a wonderful job of highlighting all of the different elements that are at play when, when families come here um, to Canada. And again, you know, their first choice is not Canada. Their first choice is to be at home and to stay at home and to live with their families and to live in peace in Syria. Um, and so I think that the, the book touches upon that as well. Um, the book does a really great job of covering so many different elements. And I think um, the different disciplines really bring that to life. Um, I always say that today's pressing social issues are really going to be solved at the intersections of different disciplines. It's not going to be just political science or just social work um, or just medicine. It's going to be all of these disciplines coming together and, and trying to solve these pressing social issues that we deal with today. And I think that the book really highlights that. So when I first saw the book and read through the, the table of contents, I got really excited to see so many different perspectives that are represented in the book. Um, it also is a real great example of um, the high degree of commitment from the Canadian government, um, the Canadian population um, to do something in the face of, of the, the horrible stories that we heard when the, 
the Syrian war first broke out. Um, and so it makes me very um, happy to be a part of that private sponsorship and proud to be living in, in Canada under that, um, under that kind of um, policy that existed. Um, at the same time, as the book reflects as well, there's areas for improvement as well. Um, so again, the, the different kinds of um, elements that were covered, um, I mean, just a sampling from some of the chapters, um, Julie Gerlais, um and colleagues' understanding of trauma and resilience that comes out um, for the different, um, for the Syrian populations um, that they were writing about in their chapter, or Andrew Tuck's um, and colleagues' um, wonderful chapter on healthcare access. Um, Jan Stewart and Danielle Char's um, chapter on the honeymoon is over and looking at how refugee youth, um, the expectations and the realities of refugee youth once they're, youth once, once they're resettled in, in Canada. Um, and especially, I mean, so many other different wonderful chapters, I don't have time to name them all. Um, the authors did a really great job, or the editors did a great job of summarizing some of the lessons learned. This idea of how refugees are represented is a theme that I saw throughout. And I oftentimes struggle with that and, and I'm hoping we can have a conversation as well about the term refugee and the, val the, the kind of the, the weight that's on that, that term of refugee. I oftentimes kind of shift back and forth depending on my audience um, or depending on you know, how people want to be depicted. So that idea of representation is really important and also how different kinds of um, underlying power structures. And I think that the chapters do a really great job of exposing the underlying power structures that exist uh, within um, Canadian society, within municipalities, um, within just social structures broadly. Um, and um, I think that that's something that's really, really um, emphasized and important to, to note. Um, let's see, other, other things I wanted to talk about. Um, the element of voice, I think, is really important and it kind of interacts with the idea of representation and how, um, how we give, uh, how voices are enabled and how uh, academic research and other kinds of mechanisms can um, assist uh, people who don't normally have a voice to have a voice in, uh, in their future and their, their realities and so forth. Um, there's an oft quoted saying that I like to use that statistics are human beings with the tears dried off. And I think um, the chapters in this um, collection really uh, challenge that and, and really take a human approach to the participants and the research and the, um, the context as well. Um, the importance of context is another element that I saw was really, um, really valid and, and really kind of prevalent throughout all the chapters, um, how the differences between um, how these, these underlying power structures are different within rural and urban communities, for example, or within different kinds of populations um, that were highlighted throughout the chapters. Um, ultimately, the chapters are really can serve as these kind of tools to advocate for political and social change. Um, I think that, you know, we come face to face with the, particip with the participants in these research studies and in, these, um, in the stories that were depicted in the chapters. And we come face to face with their experiences and their realities, but also how they persevere through the process of resettlement. And this, um, at least for me, it stirred emotion in me um, and it made me, you know, kind of um, realize that goal of, of this collective desire to make some change. Um, another element in terms of kind of the, the representation of, of, of Syrian refugees in Canada is it, it kind of, the chapters resist this fetishization of suffering. Um, we're not focusing on the trauma and the horrible things that, that families have, have experienced, even though those are very important things to, to consider, but focusing on the everyday realities, which I think is so critical when working with refugee populations. Um, oftentimes, the, the focus is on traumas and on the terrible things that, that families may have experienced. Um, but oftentimes, at least for the participants that I work with in my research projects, um, the everyday uh, traumas, the everyday experiences are the things that are most challenging for these families. Things like economic um, issues, being able to um, buy things for, ch for their children, uh, being able to live in a house that they feel proud of, um, being able to have a job. Um, these things are um, everyday, everyday challenges, everyday traumas for families, and the chapters did a good job of emphasizing all of those everyday realities. 
Um, in terms of future directions, um, as I said, I, I feel like this book really highlights how Canada does uh, as a, a kind of collectively um, can be a model uh, for other countries. And um, I would probably point this book out to other countries that are looking at doing resettlement projects because um, I, I think that there's so many lessons to be learned. Um, and there's also an acknowledgement of improvements to be made um, throughout all of the chapters and um, through, the, through the editor's comments. Um, one thing that I've, I would love to talk about maybe during the discussion is the um, impact of COVID um, on resettlement now. And I think that's such an interesting element. Obviously the book was published before COVID uh, came out. So I think that, you know, touching upon that would be really interesting to talk about today. And one thing I always mention um, is the importance of family reunification. This is something that comes out of my research. And I think it's something that should be a kind of a future direction. Um, is how important it is to, um, when we're resettling perhaps a nuclear family, mom, dad, children, um, that we also push for and consider and, and really push for policies that will re help to resettle the larger family unit, the extended family, um, especially within a Syrian, a Syrian culture as well as all, a lot of other cultures. Um, the extended family is so critical and having a, a grandmother there helps uh, with childcare, helps with um, employment, helps with um, other elements that the family might be struggling with in the resettlement process. So I just want to emphasize that idea of family reunification as a future element to really focus on. And I'll just end by saying um, I, I feel like this book really reflects a sense of hope uh, for refugee families and for countries that are um, working on resettlement programs and projects. And um, I'm really happy to be a part of this uh, discussion today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bree. You have both, all of us, all of you have great timing so far. So thank you for being mindful of that and timing in more than one sense. Bree, at the exact moment that you raised the issue of COVID and the pandemic, um, one of our participants, Christine Curry, asked this very question that we're gonna have a chance to address. So thank you both for that. Last but not least is our third panelist um, and a longtime colleague and friend and supporter of the IMRC, Dr. Audrey Macklin. Um, Dr. Macklin is professor and director of the Center for C Criminology and Sociolegal Studies and chair in international human rights law at the University of Toronto. Audrey, thank you so much for joining us um, and please take the floor. Thank you so much. And it's, it's a complete honor to be here to celebrate this wonderful book. Um, and let me just start with a little bit of envy, which is I also was one of the recipients of one of those IRCC grants. And man, I, I am like struggling to get stuff done. And you've got this fabulous edited collection out and I'm a little bit envious and but mostly just completely admiring and awestruck. So I think it's fabulous. Um, and I thought the comments of my other panelists are also terrific. And really what I'm going to do is I think maybe just supplement some of the points that they raised. Um, and one is to just, uh, in a different way, highlight what I think is a, a particularly respectful way of presenting this book, which is to say it is set up starting with those newcomers themselves, the refugees themselves, and then you move on to the, um, the resettlement context and providers and, and sponsors and so on. And what I, one of the things I like about that is that it sets it up as a kind of dialogue and a kind of conversation of two equal, equally important and equally and equal agents. And I really appreciated that as a kind of um, way of, if I can put it this way, enacting structurally in the way the book is organized, what I know the authors and you would want to convey about that, right? And so I think that is, you know, something that might be easily overlooked, but but it strikes me anyway as something worth noting and, and commending. Um, I want to also say um, others have spoken about the kind of the scale of, of the inquiries and the interdisciplinarity of it and the multidisciplinarity of it and all of that's true. I want to just add my particular appreciation for attention to rural and small and mid-sized contexts. I think that's great and I think it is otherwise perhaps underexplored um, for a variety of reasons that aren't you know that just are what they are but I actually think my very my own 
research into refugee sponsors has given me a little bit of access to places outside major centers. And I really think it is particularly, it, sponsorship can have a particularly powerful impact in those places. And the relationships are really distinctive and noteworthy and different often in ways that I think are fascinating and absolutely warranting attention on their own terms, but even as, you know, um, for comparative purposes or whatever. So I was really delighted to see that. Um, I also really um, appreciate the framing of this as a national project, and this kind of draw, builds from my last comment, because I'd be really interested to hear more about what that means to you. And I think Chris playing with grammar was a, a great way of coming at it, but also this, you know, we know the cliche about immigration being a nation building project. This is a particular episode of, you know, a national project. What's it doing? Not just for, in quotes, um, those newcomers who are uh, being resettled, but what is it doing for the nation as the nation is conceived through this? And I think that's a really important dimension of calling this a national project. I'm reminded that recently, um, uh, I, that recent statistics and recent evidence from Germany is quite interesting. As you know, um, frankly, what Germany did uh, really um, dwarfs our Canadian commitment in many ways, right? That Angela Merkel effectively permitted almost a million uh, Syrian and other refugee claimants during those critical periods to enter Germany. They entered as asylum seekers, as refugee claimants, not as resettlement, but I mean, in extraordinary numbers. And at the time, right, the slogan was, was it Wirtschaft, I don't speak German, Wirtschaften das, we can do this. And, you know, within a few months when certain things started to go wrong or whatever, she was immediately attacked. And now years later, there's a little bit of follow-up and it looks like she is being vindicated, right? And such is the evidence that I have read. And so I am struck by that as a German national project and thinking about this as a Canadian national project and how, what it's actually doing and how it is being viewed are in a sense, not identical, but equally important. Um, and you've taken here a, a, something like a snapshot in time from 2015 to 2017, but I'm really interested in your reflections of, you know, the next, phase, both as a matter of how people view it and, you know, and how it, what in fact the evidence shows and what success looks like. You know, what, what is it, you know, the IRCC tends in resettlement to define success as a kind of um, economic self-sufficiency as a definitional matter. I don't want to sell IRCC or people who work for it or people who work in resettlement short because I think they do have a, in practice, a more nuanced, expansive view. I, I'm not you know, being critical. Um, I know that my, my work on uh, those who sponsor refugees, sponsored newcomers, has uh, some very interesting insights about how the people who do it also evolve in their own understanding of what success is, what it entails, what it means to them, and as a measure, so to speak, of uh, those newcomers. And so I'd just be really interested in hearing more of your thoughts about that across the range of, of articles and, and chapters in this. Um, one question, um, you know, that I, I ask myself, I guess, is what, this was a burst of activity, just as there was in the Indo-Chinese resettlement of late, you know, 79, 80, 81, we've got this. And would it be desirable, what would it take to make this a sustainable phenomenon? Um, and what are your thoughts about how, whether that's possible or whether the very nature of this sort of activity is going to be episodic? Is that, do we just have to accept or live with that? Or what would it mean for it to get some kind of lift off and become, if I can put it this way, a kind of baked in part of the national project? Um, you know, the government, in terms of the relationships that, that Chris was talking about, about the sort of relationship of state to both newcomer state to, um, private actors and to civil society, one of the things that's pretty clear is that the state still controls numbers. Right? Um, what would it mean if, and, and this was a source of great frustration to people, what would it mean if those numbers were um, opened up 
and as many people could participate in supporting newcomer refugees as wanted to do so. I mean, I don't, what kind of shape might that take? Um, so, but broadly the question, can it be sustainable? What would it take to make this more sustainable and so on? Um, Brie mentioned something about family reunification and I wanted to just again say, as you stretch this out more longitudinally as opposed to a kind of, um, I guess, stochastic or snapshot moment, we know about the so-called echo effect that people who arrive often uh, one of the things they want to do when they are stable and settled and secure is enable their family members to come. Part of that can be uh, precluded, is not the best word for it, but part of it can be managed by settling the extended family from the get-go. That's but but the echo effect, nevertheless, is is almost inevitable. And what thoughts do you have as a policy matter about how to manage that? Um, it has been both uh, discredited, it has been used to discredit resettlement, that so many people who are resettled are in fact related to people who are already here. It has been used to also um, promote resettlement amongst those who think they can support more people, they can sponsor more people, knowing that they have, you know, that people who are sponsored have kin already in Canada who can assist with that. So there's lots of debates about it, but I wonder if there's anything that your narrative or that the evidence from the various uh, chapters leads you to think. Um, and I guess one of the other really interesting things I've come across very recently from the Canadian Council for Refugees, growing out of this and growing out of the very granular, quotidian, ordinary but profound relationships that emerge from resettlement is about a kind of ethics of practice for those who do it. We have models of how the state ought to interact with the people it addresses, it governs. You know, we have norms about that. We have you know, various kinds of norms of impartiality and bureaucratic integrity and all of that. But one of the things about all these relationships that have developed at the very grassroots granular level is what kind of ethical norms do we think are worth, should be thought about in this context? And I, I mentioned this just because it happened to Come, come into my inbox the other day that the Canadian Council for Refugees was thinking about this. And I just wondered if you had thoughts about it. Um, the last thing I'll mention uh, is I, again, I'm, I'm kind of just taking questions I've had coming out of my own research and throwing them back to you, hoping that you can answer them. But one of them is about um, what this, what the relationship is between resettlement and attitudes toward it and commitments to it and asylum seeking refugees. And what if any, you know, when we talk about lessons, and I think Chris was talking about it in a much broader sense, but what, what lessons about representation or about um, the ways in which groups are set off against each other, which is something you attended to uh, in your comments, what if anything can we use to think about that, to analyze it, uh, critique it, um, be constructive about it? So um, those are some of the questions that I have, um, but mostly I really want to just say thank you for doing this. And um, I haven't had a chance to go through all the chapters carefully, and I look forward to doing so because it's full of wonderful uh, insights and evidence and data and analysis. So thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Thanks all of the panelists and presenters. Uh, we've now finally opened uh, or arrived at the more open, looser moment where we all get to be unmuted, or I should say not all of us, those of us who've been on the screen talking, um, but we can have a conversation. Um, and thank you to people who've been posing questions, which are really thoughtful, and our panelists have also raised issues. Um, before I start sort of bringing forward those questions, are there any um, issues that the editors would like to respond to right away that have come up um, from the panelists or from the Q&A that you can see? Is there anywhere where you'd like to start off? Maybe I'll just say one thing. Thank you very much for the comments. We really uh, appreciate uh, your your careful kind of reflections and your, your wisdom in sharing it with us. And I just wanted to say to Audrey, 
you know, when we when we put the book together and we were encouraged by IRCC to sort of reach out, we did reach out to everybody who had a project funded. Oh, yeah, let me just say, this is, no, this is not about me being reached out to, this is me being pathetically unable to, you know, write as fast as you guys do, that's all. Not a criticism yeah. at all. It's no, me being we, did, we were really, we did want to be as inclusive as possible, but we really recognised that so many people were involved in so much good work and it was very difficult for people to kind of write something for to meet the timeline so so we're grateful we managed to get this together but we we very much look forward to hearing more about your work audrey in the project but we couldn't include everything yeah <laughs> not a criticism genuinely it was praise and yeah wonderful <laughs> We start maybe by talking about some of the questions and comments that were raised about private sponsorship. Um, I'll, I'll start and then I hope everyone will, will jump in. Um, yeah, thank you so much to the three of you panelists for your wonderful insights and comments and questions that you raised about the book. Um, so I wanted to start by maybe answering Polkeet's question around why private sponsors are so keen to sponsor refugees, and then some additional comments that came up. And I know, uh, you know, Bree, you talked about your experience, and Audrey, you've done a ton of work in this area. So I hope that uh, people will jump in and expand. But I wanted to pull from uh, Mary Jane Blaine's chapter in the book on uh, sponsorship agreement holders and private sponsorship to answer that question around the motivation and what um, Blaine and her colleagues discuss on page 226 is the idea that typically there were several elements to private sponsors motivations. Um, generally, a lot of them had humanitarian and ethical dimensions and she she talks about the representation of refugees and how refugees were represented in the media was often sort of the initial um, motivation for people to be thinking about this. But then when she asked people to reflect further on their motivations, most respondents talked about how, you know, private sponsorship very much was um, in line with the forms of community engagement that characterized their own personal, professional, civic, or spiritual journeys. And I thought that was a really, um, profound kind of insight in that chapter. Um, like Bree, um, I was part of a, a group of five who sponsored a family and I know that uh, I think the majority of the rest of the group is actually here on the on, at the launch. So thank you for coming and feel free to uh, jump in. But I think um, for many people, you know, some of the respondents asked about what are the benefits and I think um, you know, it's hard to talk about intangible benefits or the joy that you experience as a sponsor when you see the sponsored family, the kids score their first goal at a soccer game or watch the kids settle into school and really integrate into the educational system. But I think those are some real benefits for sponsors and even just the community building that happens within your group of five is really quite powerful knowing watching your friends come together and mobilize and and resettle a family is incredibly um, empowering and um, yeah. I'll stop there and hope the rest of you can jump in to answer all these wonderful questions that came up about sponsorship. I'll just summarize one of those questions before the rest of you jump in, because I think it's a good one. And it builds on um, what Audrey was mentioning about some of the critiques of the private sponsorship, which is um, this question is from Kate, um, asking you all to speak about some of the tensions um, when private sponsorship began to overtake Govern, that's the word Kate uses in her question, government sponsorship um, in terms of perhaps a what's seen as a burden or a shifting of responsibility to civil society and um, investment of resources. So perhaps as we discuss private sponsorship, others could address Kate's question. Anyone want to take that up? So, uh, well, maybe I'll say a couple things and then Louisa, if you want to jump in. Uh, one of the things that that was kind of interesting, I think Louisa spoke to it in terms of the, the sense of inequity that was experienced um, by some. And that that feeling of inequity is was also on the part of private sponsors who were sponsoring refugees who were not coming from Syria. And so there was this kind of commitment being made and people were having to wait for years 
for their families from say the Horn of Africa to come. And, and they're, so, so again, that speaks to the inequity around like between different private sponsorships. But in, in light of Kate's question, I think it's something that many researchers have pointed on and are, are kind of being a, fairly wary about in terms of whether the federal government is allowing private sponsorship to effectively um, sideload the responsibility uh, so, so, so taking, privatizing the refugee system. And it, it's particularly, I mean, private sponsorship, Canada's private sponsorship model has been particularly popular at the global scale. And so certainly there is a sense that that can step in to overcome some of the resistance that, that national governments have to resettling refugees when they can hear from their own citizens who say, we want to do more here. We want to help settle refugees. But of course, the problem with the private sponsorship aspect is sometimes you don't know how well those families are doing. And maybe those families are not accessing the kinds of services that are generally available to government sponsored refugees. I mean, the data suggests private sponsored refugees do better in terms of they enter the labor market faster. There may be some downsides to that if they may be just picking up survival jobs because they don't want to be a burden to their sponsors. Yeah. Um, and there is another thing, I mean, in the chapter that I write with my colleagues, uh, Louisa and um, I, I, Wynne Dam and Blair Cullen and others, we talk about communities. And I think not only do you have to have a private sponsorship model, you have to understand sponsorship at the level of the community. You have to give communities a way to be participants in this. And I think Audrey's comment on Germany is interesting because yes, Angela Merkel did something very significant by opening the borders and allowing uh, you know, over a million refugees to come in. But there was some concern because the communities where many refugees were, were sort of sent felt as if they were never involved in a discussion about that. And I think that's something, as well as the idea of privately sponsoring refugees, we have to understand the role of the community writ large in terms of sponsoring and I think Canada has some very interesting examples that could accompany that private sponsorship model as it makes its global route around best practices. I think we talk about the local immigration partnerships for example. I think some of those structures are equally as important and I think they might help address some of the tensions that Kate mentions as well in terms of becoming too reliant on privatizing something that is a national commitment. Canada has agreed to an international convention you know, and in meeting our international obligations, we need to find ways to be more collective in terms of meeting them, I would say. A question just came in um, building on this discussion of the relationship between privately sponsored refugees and government sponsored refugees from Aziz Rahman. Thank you, Aziz. Um, if there is information that you can share on comparing those, those two groups and their e experiences of economic integration. So I, I can uh, jump in and, and answer that and I think connect a few of the things. First of all, I really want to thank um, our three panelists for their amazing insights and I guess the distance that you have uh, because on the one hand you're familiar with these topics but you come from a different perspective and you weren't as involved in the nitty-gritty of putting all of this together so your comments I think gave us a different perspective on those things that have been there that we've discussed and addressed um, but also enable us to grasp some of the things that we're not aware and I think the the one thing thing that we take away is the city of ethics of practice uh, that Audrey brought up and the granular and the everyday that Brie also touched on in terms of the fact that it's that labor of everyday uh, struggles with very little things and in terms of the inequities that have been raised is I think putting in perspective what this experience is bringing in terms of the newcomers teaching us Canadians is giving us perspectives on different things, on where we're located and our social relations and how we use particular structures and services and how we all are differently positioned in relation to those things. So being 
in a relationship with a family that just arrived in very, very particular circumstances repositions us. Um, so I will get to the uh, economic question, but the one thing that maybe we speak a lot of the differences between the government sponsored refugees and the privately sponsored refugees. One thing that I think comes up through this, um, the different projects that are included in the work is also the difference between um, different sponsors and the fact that different sponsors have different levels of commitment, of knowledge, of experience and reasons for doing that. So the ethics are, there are so many ethics in so many different ways, depending on the region and the context where you're located, what are the economic circumstances, the cost of housing, the languages that are being spoken, the group that sponsored you, uh, the specific um, landlord that uh, gave their building uh, to refugees. So all those tiny little things together create such a diverse and multiple experiences. And I think the book um, maybe hopefully tries to convey the complexity of all of this. And in terms of projecting ourselves in the future, yes, this has been a learning uh, for Canada as, as a social project in terms of addressing a lot of the needs that we have here, including amongst our Indigenous communities that um, do not even have some of those basic resources that we as Canadians take for granted. So to come to the economic question, it is important, and I think we stress it in the book, uh, in acknowledging that the refugees who came as government-sponsored refugees had a very different profile compared to some of the privately sponsored refugees, particularly in terms of the government selecting the most vulnerable. So including large families with a lot of children, um, families who were maybe less educated, who didn't have any knowledge of French or English when they arrived, compared to the privately sponsored refugees who were selected by the sponsors and sometimes uh, were more educated, came from urban regions, maybe had a knowledge of uh, official languages, and therefore their starting point was very, very different. And then the structures that they were provided, the supports were also very different. So I think Margaret's comments about the community is really that it takes a village to make all of this happen. So it's unfair on the sponsors to put all the responsibility on them, the financial and the emotional responsibility, as well as the responsibility for taking care in contexts where maybe they don't have the knowledge about how to register for language courses, how to access particular services. And it's also unfair to think that the government sponsored refugees will have enough with a settlement worker who will help them. They all need a very expansive network and it should be many people involved in many different ways. So one of the other lessons that we chose through these collaborations and the partnerships is I think we need to recognize that the Canadian settlement um, architecture has become more complex in terms of different sectors now working together. Health, uh, employment, language, education, whereas before settlement was its own separate little thing and had to manage to do everything. So I think we're getting towards this more integrated uh, support systems where the whole village will become involved. Mm -hmm. So for the economic question, uh, we need to recognize that uh, different refugees or and, and I agree with Bria, but I have a hard time saying the word refugee because once they're here, they're not refugees. They are permanent residents. And so speaking of newcomers or families or future Canadian citizens um, is important to recognize and remove that label. They came here under certain conditions that were not of their choosing, but the, the label sticks. So we should um, change it and find a different term uh, to explain because once they arrive, they're not a refugee anymore. They're, they're, they're future citizens, that's what they are. So recognizing that they come from very, very different places and have very different tools is I think what can allow us to have that community support that we need to make this successful.
Great, thank you. I, I want to raise um, a topic that's come up now a few times, uh, including just now with a question from John Shields. And this is the question of how people are faring during the pandemic. Um, this came up uh, earlier with a question from Christine Curry, who says healthcare continues to underappreciate the vulnerability um, of newcomers and the, the disproportionate struggles during the pandemic. Um, I think, Bri, you also raised this issue of COVID in your comments. Would any of you be able to speak to this? I, I can start if you want, um, unless, Margaret, do you want to go first or? Okay. okay. Yeah, so just a few thoughts. Thanks for these questions around the impact of COVID on resettlement. I think, first of all, we've seen this resilience of the sector yet again. So once again, just like the sector did when the um, Operation Syrian Refugees was announced by the federal government, once again, the sector showed incredible resilience and completely pivoted and adapted within a matter of weeks. So in many settlement agencies, at least the ones that I work, um, have partnered with here in Calgary, within two weeks, they had adapted programs and services into a virtual space, um, which was really incredible. But I think when uh, many of these programs and services were adapted into a virtual space, what we saw was this importance of di digital literacy, both within the sector, but then also within refugees themselves. Um, and so this idea of digital literacy, I think, becomes increasingly important. Um, I would say that um, COVID did interrupt resettlement. Um, we certainly saw it interrupt the schooling of children. Um, many of whom perhaps, you know, their language acquisition was even interrupted when schools eventually adapted to a virtual environment. But I think, you know, even with the adults, their language classes were interrupted and that's going to stall social integration, but also economic integration, which I think raises questions around, um, you know, the eligibility of federal funding, um, the ability of refugees to pay off transportation loans, and other issues that are really, um, you know, those policies are designed based on a different set of circumstances, not thinking about the pandemic and the interruptions it caused. So those are some initial thoughts, but I'm sure other people have things to add. I might, I might just add one thing, Leah, there. So, so obviously one of the significant consequences in terms of the labor market scarring that might accompany this is for, for families that have been planning to engage in family reunification, they have to have a certain amount of income to be able to qualify through the federal government scheme. And so delaying the ability of um, individuals of families to achieve that kind of economic standing is going to have a, a longer term delay. But interestingly, there's been some, I mean, some immigration and labor economists have responded to the issue of COVID 19s kind of the economic scarring that might occur in terms of the impact it has on the labor market by suggesting that really what the government should be doing is, is not thinking about bringing in more economic migrants, but actually using this opportunity to engage in family reunification, recognizing as COVID has highlighted to many of us that, you know, that the family, your, your social bubble, your family, your supports are incredibly important during these kinds of periods. Of time and so perhaps it could be a bit of a reset by refocusing on the importance of family reunification which was mentioned by Brie um, as well and and I'm, I mean John Shields asked of questions knows very well about the significance of family and how often our economic calculations do not recognize the significance of having a family unit not just the nuclear but more expansive than that come together and so it might be one of the possible, it's certainly going to be a consequence of the pandemic in terms of uh, delaying the ability of families to engage in that through the policy norms. But I think also it might encourage a policy reset in regards to that. It could be possible. Thank you. Um, another issue that's come up uh, is a question that Suzanne Ilkan brings to us. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, she wants to know, are there lessons from newcomers themselves about their relationships with sponsors, about the sponsorship process? Um, and I was wondering if maybe we could even tie this to one of the questions that Audrey posed about um, the lessons that this particular um, resettlement 
uh, lens to the issue of what happens to people who are seeking asylum and their experiences. Mm -hmm. um, might anyone take those questions up? Louisa? Oh, I don't know what to say. This is um, a really uh, big question. And I think we really mentioned the fact that refugees don't want to be refugees. They want to be home. And I wonder to some extent, I mean, in terms of one of the refugees, or rather Syrians among other newcomers have really shown their contributions. And um, many of them are now Canadian citizens. Um, they have received leadership awards, they've created jobs, uh, they've created um, through entrepreneurship, they've, they've already contributed, they've really hit the ground uh, running. So in terms of the, the lessons of this resettlement, I wonder if it, it prepared us for the pandemic in a way of uh, coming together. Um, but yeah, I think I've lost my train of thoughts. I'm sorry. Um, I wonder if one of the panelists also wants to, to add and, and well, share. Well, I would just add, I mean, I would just add, I, I really, that one of the chapters in the book is by uh, Chris Karakides and others. Um, and, and it's a really interesting uh, review of, I'm just trying to find it now. Uh, it's called Splits in the Neighborhood, Negotiating Visibility in a Rural Reception Context. And I think that chapter is fascinating for this issue of, you know, it, ident roles of agency and the realization, especially for sponsors. I mean, sometimes the, especially the private sponsorship scheme could be accused of being somewhat sort of paternalistic. And I think what Chris, is, Chris and his colleagues in that chapter reveal is, you know, that, there, that some of the Syrian refugees who were settled in these smaller rural areas, you know, they really were adamant that they needed to have a role in determining what was happening to them and their future. And, th and their sponsors were trying to kind of control what was going on. And I think that issue of agency is, is really well highlighted in his chapter. Um, and so in answer to Suzanne's question, I think, I think there is, um, there is a, an important analysis that needs to be done in terms of a care, carefully looking at that relationship and some of the, some of the limitations and downsides. And again, this issue of representation that's been highlighted by so many people and, and the panelists and that chapter does a very good job, I think, of, of discussing it. Mm. I was just going to add that that chapter and, and other other things I've read as well. And, and I mean, Chris Kirakidi's work is, is amazing on this in terms of it, the agency of, of uh, families who've been resettled. But this idea that it, there can be splits within, I've read that there can be splits within these sponsoring agent, uh, sponsoring units about how to handle, uh, how, to, how to work with the family, how to be a community and so forth and it, it really is highlighted in, in all this wonderful research that has come out uh since the private sponsorship program has been about so there's you know some people who are very hands-off you know and i remember actually one one um just anecdotally one uh family that i uh was was sponsoring the refugee family that i was doing the private sponsorship with they were themselves iraqi refugees and i remember he said to me you know what they've been through war they can get their own bank card you know, and I love that quote because it's it's true. It's it's very much you know these uh, the, the families that have, have gotten to Canada have gone through so many things and they've done they've done it all by themselves. You know, and so I think that those things are very much highlighted in in Chris's chapter as well as other other writing on this. And it's uh, I think it's really an important lesson to learn from the research that's coming out of the resettlement process in Canada. Mm -hmm. I want oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I was, I'm trying to trying to tie loose threads together and this question of agency and the question of the lessons and the refugee policy and the asylum seekers. And certainly that's one of the great dividing lines is the notion that for resettled refugees and the way government would like to encourage that agency because that's for its interest, it sees that as part of, you know, uh, people adjusting to their way of life and getting a job and being independent that one year's up and we're fine, everything works, right? 
Um, we're asylum seeker, we're really not interested in agency. Um, we don't want um, sort of autonomous agents who self self select to make their own choices. That's much more about how to circumscribe and control the actions because they weren't uh, um, selected uh, abroad and therefore pre approved by the government. Therefore, there's a t completely different relationship in terms of how the state seeing them uh, for all for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but the agent agency is not a big part of that. But ultimately, agencies are, can be allowed once they're, they're accepted as refugees and then they, because then they're, they're following that other pathway. Um, but up until then, agency for the state certainly would be a bit more dangerous because that's your question of, you know, uh, the classic, they want to control this a lot more because they're, they're, this, this, they're more afraid of this as a movement than a movement where somebody's far away and they can select and make choices. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that transition. That <laughs> in our last few minutes to, I'm going to tie together two questions that have just come in recently. One from Mike Malloy who asks, is it time for us to let go of some of these categories that we've been clinging to for so long, specifically since private sponsorship was launched in 78, 79? And this I'm going to tie to a question that comes in from Pedro Chavez, who says, in the US, a refugee stays categorized as such officially until they adjust status to permanent residency. Is there a different process in Canada? So perhaps people could speak to those two questions. Well, I think, and I appreciate Chris's point because, again, this we have a, we have this this celebration of agency in one con one category as opposed to another. In terms of Pedro's question, you know, I think we when Justin Trudeau was at the airport welcoming the initial families that were arriving, he took great pleasure in making it clear they were arriving as permanent residents. So when, as a government-sponsored refugee, you are, you are given that acknowledgement. And it's not the case for asylum seekers. So the asylum seeker process is hugely drawn out in terms of maintaining individuals in that liminal kind of status. And, and, so, and then just to, to Mike's point, I mean, it is interesting, I think, also this new um, initiative that has just recently come up, which is the economic refugee stream. I, I thought I find that interesting because it, it does almost challenge that that categorization. We always there's this notion of oh if you're a refugee it means that you're not really that we're helping you right. If you're an economic migrant you're helping us, and it's not like that. And so this this effort to kind of mix things up I think is um, I think is interesting and and it'll be interesting to see what happens. I'll just add that, yeah, I think, I think in the future, we really need to rethink these categories that we're using. Um, I think the book highlights this, this idea of mixed migration too, Margaret, like this, this way of, um, that people are, it's, it's a well-founded fear of persecution, maybe, yes, but it's also other things, family violence, it can be economics, economic issues. Um, so I think kind of changing this language, I think, you know, 1951 is a long time to have that, that term refugee and how, how we define it and how we use it. Um, but and I think the other thing is um, climate, uh, climate refugees. So uh, people who are going to be fleeing, uh, not for well-founded fear of persecution, but a well-founded fear of, of, you know, annihilation and, and destruction of, of home and community. So. I, I just add, I, I also struggle with terminology and I don't have an easy answer to it because added into this is that from what I have understood mostly secondarily is that it's also the case that some people who arrive as refugees um, really don't want that label. And it's so, such a stigmatized label that they've lived with for so long in other places and, and all of that. But there are also those who come to reclaim it um, as a sign of their perseverance and their ability to, over, you know, to have surmounted or overcome or however you want to put it. So, I struggle with this myself, and I'm not even sure that there is a considered or consistent way of approaching it. Um, and so sometimes I find myself just switching language, just using as many different terms as I can, you know, between newcomer, new Canadian, refugee, you know, a variety of them, because I'm not sure if we imagine that we want to be respectful of the people we're talking about. I'm not even sure if there is a uniform or universal way of, of doing that. So I, I just, that's just a way of saying, I appreciate the critique, absolutely. But I find myself kind of stuck. Mm. And 
we may also, sorry, can I jump in? I didn't forgot to raise my blue hand up at the top. Um, there's also then the legal ramifications, which are we are embedded within a whole sort of, you know, regime that is set by terminology. And so moving from that in of itself is already a dangerous thing. And is there, but is there a way to have a policy language that's different than maybe a legal framework or a way to have a discursive language that's promoted in our public discourse that's different than that legal without losing the power of the legal? Because part of what is powerful about, I think sometimes things like the private sponsorship and why people are drawn to it is because that language resonates so so closely for many people. Um, so when you take it away, you also lose some of the, the ability for people to connect emotionally, I think, and very strongly, which motivates them um, to, to become involved. So it, it's, yeah, I, I don't have an answer either. Um, it's problematic, but I think, you know, maybe one way is that we accept that there may be various ways and we need, we need to experiment with them, but somewhere we still need to have that commitment that's really founded and clearly founded so we know when, when we're not meeting our obligations as well. Um, the fact that we have, you know, so many conversations underway and so many good questions still coming in, but that we are also now just slightly after seven o'clock and need to close our conversation is, I think, suggestive of the fact that this is a really good piece of work and very important issues. I want to say thank you to the editors and all of the contributors to the collection for, for giving us this work to to make our way through and for prompting these conversations. And as Chris mentioned, all of the questions and projects that must build on conversations begun by, by your scholarship. Um, I also wanna say thank you to the panelists for your thoughtful and considered um, responses to the book, for raising great questions and to our participants who we can't see, <laughs> but we've had the pleasure of hearing from you in the Q&A on the screen. Um, I hope these conversations continue. It feels like a real privilege to be able to gather in any capacity right now. So I'm very happy to have been able to be part of this. Um, and I look forward to future conversations for those of you who are interested in these issues, please keep an eye on the website of the Balsili School and also the International Migration Research Center. Um, we'll be having other conversations um, this semester and next about these issues. Um, and we're starting a podcast series as well for, for to keep the conversations going. So thanks everyone, um, keep well, and uh, thank you for a great conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to the authors for the editors for a wonderful book. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so panelists. much yeah. to the panelists for your very, very generous uh, comments. It's um, It's been really a, a fantastic experience, even though it's a virtual um, a book lounge. And thank you to all the participants who've, who've stayed and engaged with us. And it would be amazing to, to have, uh, to continue those conversations as Alison uh, mentioned. And thank you, Alison, for being yeah. such a wonderful chair and to yeah. Joanne for coordinating everything. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Good night, everybody.